Wow, thank you. What a blessing. Music, prayer, and it's a feast. Let's enjoy God's word together. Um, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I invite you today to reflect on this question to get us started. What does your life center around? What does your life center around? Reflect on that. And I want to share an example about a simple motor. Um, one of, there's so many things I love about the Logos Church, and I want to encourage you. I, I think the sense of family, the sense of community support, uh, dedication, faithfulness, so many people serving in so many ways. And there's another thing that I love about this church. It's that there's a strong mountain biking community. <laughs> um, so this example of, of being centered in alignment, a very, very relevant, maybe timely example is a mountain bike. It's a simple motor. Your legs are the engine, and I have a bike. I'm still a beginner, but I'm I'm loving this. This is a wonderful new sport for me. Um, Not too long ago, I had this problem where my back tire kept rubbing on the edge of the frame every time. And so, you know, just a little bit of being off-center can cause so many problems on a simple motor, like a, a mountain bike, a simple machine. So for me, it was, it was rubbing, it was slowing me down, I'm trying to push and <laughs> putting all this effort into it, but it's, it's like a brake, constantly being braking my bike. Um, if I take the wheel off and try to adjust it too much myself, it's going to throw off the gears and the derailleur, so these parts are all interconnected, and we're looking at a very simple machine, it's a bicycle, <laughs> you know? but think about that principle, if alignment and being centered is that important on a simple machine like a mountain bike, how much more in our lives, in our souls, and our beliefs. Amen? So this has been so helpful and healthy for me personally to look at the Lord's Prayer and to learn to pray from the Son of God Himself. And I think this, you know, these, these two verses that we're looking at today, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. If, you could, if I can encourage you to pray through those ideas this week every single day as you go, as you drive, as you, you know, wash the dishes at all times, I believe it can transform our lives. And I know we all come today, we're, we're across the full spectrum as a community. We have pain, suffering, loss, grief, um, mourning, healing, new life. We have it all as a community. And when we can set our sights again and center our lives around God, His kingdom, His holiness, and His intimacy with us as our Abba Father, and pray for the kingdom and the will of God to come on earth as it is in heaven, earth will open up before the children of God. No matter what happens, His will will come, and His will will be done in our hearts first, in our families, in this church body, through all of that. And he will be glorified as a result. So what does your life center around? Our hearts and lives will seek after that which we most want. Whatever it is that I want, my life will seek after that thing. What's more, we also, this is a potentially scary thought, we become what we love. We become what we love. In a book called Desiring the Kingdom, James K. A. Smith wrote, You are both, you, I'm sorry, you are what you love because you live toward what you want. The longings of the heart both point us in a direction and propel us toward that direction. The longings of our heart set whatever that target is and drive us there. They both point us and propel us. So what do you want? What is it that your life centers around? 
And what do you truly love? And I believe for each of us every week, we need this time with the church, in God's word, with song, with prayer, to correct our hearts and our love, to readjust our desires. We need this weekly, don't we? I get distracted and pulled in so many different directions. It bounces from achievement. That's the thing I really want. And then it bounces to, no, it's, it's not achieve anymore. I just need to rest. I need to, to know when I can maybe retire or find that, that end to my work. Maybe it's security, resolution to a stressful relationship. All of these things are good. But you can also see how it becomes a slippery slope and that becomes my obsession. And I can't, I can't change my sights and, and readjust my heart until this one thing is achieved. Maybe it's feeling valued, feeling more valued than I feel right now. Maybe it's just having a more clear sense of purpose. What is the end and the purpose of all of this, all my labor? Again, these are not bad things, but they are not ultimate things. It has to be something greater than all of these. Other. These are really the symptoms of our heart, the symptoms of our longings. So that which our lives center around is a good indicator of what we truly love. This is why Jesus, after conquering death, he spoke with Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, do you believe that I truly rose from the dead? That was pretty obvious to Peter. Do you believe that I have power to heal and feed the multitudes? That was obvious to Peter as well. But belief wasn't enough. He got after Peter's heart. Peter, do you truly love me? Jesus asked him. And that's what he asked us as his disciples. And when we pray like Jesus and pray through the Lord's Prayer, our hearts and our love are turned back to God once again. So, I pray this morning that together we can let sacred scripture, the words of Christ himself, fill our imagination, redirect us to the truth, and that we will thirst more and more to abide in the one and only source of blessing that can truly satisfy, that can truly quench our thirst. Disciples of Jesus are taught that when we pray, we reflect upon our standing with God and we reorder our lives in response to his glorious holiness. And let's start with that first. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Well, Jesus was speaking to, to disciples who were Hebrew. So we need to, we need to understand a little bit first um, what was their connotation. When God says, hallowed, or when Jesus said, hallowed be your name, what were they thinking when they heard this word hallowed? It's an old English word, um, and it, it's a synonymous with holy. You know, so hallow, these, these hallowed waters, some would say, um, they're sacred, so they need to be hallowed. They need to be treated as sacred. For the Hebrews, the idea of holiness, it, we usually can think holiness means to be set apart for something sacred, and that's true. But I hope we can visualize in a more true sense, like based on the history of this Israelite nation, how did they picture the idea of holiness? So I think you can go way back, um, I mean, with God, God forms covenants with people throughout their history. And let's just jump in this timeline of covenants. Let's jump in with Moses, truly the birth of a full nation as opposed to a, a family or a tribe. So with Moses, God reveals his holiness to him when he's all alone on a mountain called Mount Sinai. And he sees this fire and a bush that's not being consumed, and he hears the voice of God. But it's, it's kind of covered and hidden, and he, Moses says, I want to see your glory. Later on, he prays, I want to see the, the full glory of God. And God says, you will not be able to see my face, but hide in this cleft of the rock, and I will pass by, and you will see me in my glory. So that was one of Moses' encounters with holiness. Then he sees the supreme might of God over and above Egypt, the most powerful empire in that part of the world at the time. God demolishes the the power of Egypt and sets his people free. He rescues many. They pass through the Nile. 
on the other side of the Nile, of the Red Sea, God parts the Red Sea, they leave. On the other side, in the wilderness, he takes them back to that same spot, Mount Sinai. And it's not the mountain itself that's important, but God always uses a mountain as well to reveal his glory. So at Mount Sinai, again, the voice of God speaks over the people, probably about three million people that left Egypt, including some Egyptians who had uh, seen the power of God and wanted to become his people, and God embraced them as well. They see the glory of God in Mount Sinai. It's shrouded with clouds. They hear the voice from heaven just as Moses had. And when Moses comes down from the mountain, remember the first time he had seen fire and light in the bush, now he comes down having seen the glory of God as this light as well. And you guys know this story. He, he arrives back with the people. They had to put a veil over Moses' face because he was reflecting the glory of God to them. And in that passage, we get the idea the glory of God is not something reserved just to stay up on this holy mountain covered in a cloud. The purpose of this, the ultimate purpose of God's glory is to bounce off of his people so that all can see his glory. Way back with Moses. Now remember, these Jews, these disciples, they, they were not really that educated, but this was their heritage. So they knew these stories well, but no one understood or could explain to them how Christ was fulfilling all of that. So when Christ says, hallowed be the name of God, he's alluding to this concept of holiness and glory and light and brightness. Now, holiness was further entrenched into their community and their way of living. Um, God gave them instructions and he said, have a tabernacle, even as you're traveling through the wilderness, have a tabernacle at the center of your community. And the tabernacle will have an outer court. It'll have um, a, pl- a common area where people will enter and bring their sacrifices. And it'll have a holy place, but then it'll have a veil and a most holy place in the inside. Can you picture these concentric circles where the holy of holies, the sacred presence of God is the center. And then it expands outward from there. And then that's the end of the tabernacle. And then begin the settle, the tents. The, the tribes are all scattered in all directions around this. So picture this again. We have the Sinai mountain. We have all the tents and tribes. And the center of their community is the tabernacle with the presence of a holy God. And their community spreads out from there. So we ask that That heritage, what is your life centered around? Well, their life was centered around the holy presence of God in a very physical, literal sense. That's what centered their lives. And when God gave them the commandments again through Moses, remember the Sabbath, one day, that's a strong ratio, six days of work, one day of Sabbath. And he says, remember the Sabbath, what's the second part? By keeping it holy. So once a week, we're centering our lives around the holiness of God. It's set apart, it's sacred to receive honor and then reflect his glory. So when Jesus teaches his disciples, he says, Hallowed be the name of God. He's saying this same Hebrew entrenched in thousands of, of years of history of honoring the holiness of God, that is not changing. God is no less holy. Hallowed be the name of the sacred, precious God. That's not changing. But he couples this idea of God's holiness, he couples it with something that was earth-shattering at the time, and it should be today as well. This same holy God we can refer to as our Abba Father. And Abba is a very endearing term. It's like daddy. You know, it's like a childlike faith. For the Israelites, this was not their view of a holy God. Their view of a holy God was a God who, if you do not handle the sacred things well, he has the power to strike you down dead. If you enter the holy of holies without being consecrated, you need to fear for your life. This is why they would attach bell, a bell onto the ankle of the high priest when he'd go in once a year to do the sacred um, commandments and carry out those sacraments and the holy of holies because if he died, they needed to know so they could pull out his body. You could only enter the presence of a holy God with a rope tied to your ankle and bells on your ankle so they could hear whether or not you had died in the presence of a sacred God. And Jesus says, our Father, not just his Father, 
the father of the perfect lamb, he's involving his disciples now, the family of God. Doesn't that blow your mind? That's what Christ is making possible through his work. How does this happen? Well, this is, this is the wonderful work of Christ, which we've, um, I think it's like a, 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 a prism where the light can shine. We see it in so many different angles. So I want to capture how this is possible with one text, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. The author of Hebrews writes, Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus then invites his disciples to look at God as the prodigal son had. Do you remember this parable that Jesus told of the prodigal son? Asked for his inheritance early, shaming his father. Ran away, blew it all, spent it all and was abandoned, was living in the middle of the pigs, literally the pig sty and the slop that they were fed. And he comes to the father in his filth and stink and as he's walking down the lane toward his father, this is the image that Christ gives us of God, our father. It's a God who, despite that treatment, takes his robes up shamelessly, shows his legs to the, whoever's watching, and runs to embrace his son. That's when we picture our father in heaven. He's no less holy, but through Jesus, we can now view our father as this as that father who runs to embrace us, stinky, poor, helpless sinners, throws his arms around us, weeps when we come running to him and wanting to be restored into his family. So Jesus reminds us, when you are at peace with your father, that's when you are fulfilling your purpose. You cannot be at peace with the father until you know the Son. Only through Christ can you have that type of peace with the Father to call Him Abba and run into His arms like a prodigal son. And He is no less holy, but Christ's holiness washes over you. And you can enjoy that type of fellowship. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Well, with that foundation in place, this is where I want to encourage you and challenge you to action, okay? So, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We see God for who he is. Now we move to our encouragement and our action. Your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So first, the kingdom of God, the kingdom come. So the second question I want to ask you related to the kingdom of God is this. If Jesus came to bring a totally different understanding of what matters in life, you know, he comes to completely recenter his people around his father once more. The holiness of God is the thing which centers our lives. If Jesus came to do that, there's going to be disruption. The way the patterns of this world, the way things typically arrange themselves are no longer okay. So through this disruption, it's Their scripture uses terms of battle, this analogy of warfare. We put on the armor of Christ for this level of disruption that the coming of God's kingdom will bring. So here's the question. In the midst of the disruption that the kingdom of Christ comes to recenter and reorder the world around the glory of the Father, can we find rest? Can we find peace, particularly in the face of this messy, disruptive war that we're called to as children of God and as his disciples. Is there, is it possible for us to find peace? Jesus tells us, blessed are the peacemakers for they will see God. And if we're going to see this holy God, 
who Christ made it possible. He tore the veil of the temple. He makes it possible. But to see God, we need to be peacemakers. The idea of peace in Scripture is not like I would typically think in the USA. It's to not be at war, you know, or to simply not have war on the American soil or to not have to have a draft to get more soldiers in the army. That level of peace is, is a very low bar. The Hebrew, the biblical understanding of peace is shalom. And this is a relational peace of complete rest, not just um, to simply you know, cease fighting, but to be at complete relational unity restored. That's our unity with our Creator, our unity with one another as God's people, and even our peace and relational unity with this very earth. This is the same earth God will redeem someday. and He's in the process of healing this land and redeeming the very land we have. Well, 2 Corinthians is helpful. 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 5, 13 says, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. So this idea, again, Jesus brings the kingdom of God. It's a light in the darkness. And anything that the light of God touches, two things happen. It's exposed for what it truly is. But if the light pierces through that darkness that it exposed, it becomes light. And that's how simple the salvation we experience through Christ can be. In a dark room, you light one match. It dispels all the darkness. One little match. And the light of Christ, the speed of light, that's how quickly the light of Christ can touch our hearts. It will expose the sin. It will expose everything that's not ordered around the holiness of God. But the promise included here is that it will make those very dark places, it will make them light. Not our light, not our hard work, our labor. It's the grace of Christ. It changes our very nature. It makes us like Christ. The same passage, 2 Corinthians 4, a little bit later, verse 17, Paul says, the face of Christ, we see the weight of the glory of God. The weight. Think of the weightiness here. When something heavy is placed inside something else, like a rock, picture we have a big tub, a plastic tub full of water. We take a rock, the weight of the rock dropped in the water, it will sink all the way to the bottom. And then if we took, we took a separate tub of uh, the same size, big plastic tub, we filled it with oil, and we poured water on top of that oil, you'd be able to visualize this bubble of water sinking all the way down to the bottom of this barrel of oil. Because water is heavier than the oil. Augustine of Hippo makes this point. He says, everything in this earth has a way of settling itself somewhere. Fire, you make a, a, fire, a bonfire, a fire pit, flames tend to go what direction? The flames tend to go up. Water and oil tends to go down. Something heavy like a rock will sink if it's something that's not as heavy, like a, a big snowbank, right? So everything in this world has a way of ordering itself. And here's the quote that Augustine said that I think is so helpful for answering the question of peace. He said this, Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. He says, We are made by you, God. We are made for yourself. And our hearts will be restless until they rest in you. When you think of this, the image of God himself, this holy God, the glory of God in the face of Christ lands on the earth. He forces everything to reshuffle. And we have light at the top, darkness at the bottom. Holiness at the top, sin at the bottom. And the glory face of Christ, the weight of the glory, causes all of earth to reshuffle in response to it. This is such a beautiful idea. It's encouraging to me. When I see something in the world that this is, this is not right, this is not good, and this is not okay, I know this is against God's will. And God's kingdom, he brought the kingdom, but why can there still be such a level of injustice or oppression 
or suffering of great people. Why can that be? The reason we ask these questions is because it's true. We are made in the image of God, and He gives us the ability to see things in this ordered way. His holiness reshuffles all of the world. Now, this is that, that's our encouragement. See the holy face of God. Visualize the weight of Christ's glory impacting every aspect of this earth. And now for our last challenge. If this is true, what does it all mean for us as a body? We are the, the body of Christ. Now we are his disciples. How do we join him in this mission of making his creation the way he wants it? Bringing order again out of chaos. I want to encourage you with this. The work you do here as a body and as a church is vital. It's not enough to come together once a month or every other week. You know, we need to be reminded and let our imagination, our eyes, and our, our spiritual sight shuffle in response to the holy glory face of Christ. Let that shine on all that we do. And we need this encouragement weekly. George Herbert said, Sundays for the church are the pillars upon which heaven's arches rest. Isn't that a wonderful image? Our Sundays are like the pillars upon which heaven's arches rest. And he said this as well. The Sundays of man's life threaded together on time's string make the bracelets to adorn his wife our eternal, glorious King. So all that we do on a Sunday, it's like every Sunday is like a pearl that on the string of time adorns the bride of Christ. What we're doing in the communion here together, becoming more like Christ, enjoying Him, learning how to pray as Christ prayed so that we can become like Christ and reflect that glory. That's the answer to the world's problems. Jesus was able to sleep in the middle of a storm. You remember that story? Storm hits their little boat, and they're, these are fishermen, veteran fishermen, and they're panicking because it's such a bad storm. And Jesus is sleeping. And he stands up. He says, be still. I am Lord. And Jesus speaks that same peace message to us today. In the face of a storm, he stands up. He brings rest, and he brings calm, for he is Lord. Picture this as well, a silic, um, tornado, hurricane, all right? These storms, you feel the winds coming around. Even last night is getting very windy. feels like maybe a tornado will hit the front range. These winds on the outside, um, they push things away. But as you get closer to the storm, like on a tornado or hurricane, it pulls you closer to the center. So Christ came like a storm to this earth. He came to bring disruption. And just like the Hebrew community was centered around the holiness of God, if Christ is the face of that holy God, as we get closer and closer to him, we're sucked in closer to Christ with more and more force. But as we are pulled away from God, we can be flung far away, like a hurricane will, will fling things from miles away. But as we're drawn into the center, the, the epicenter of that volcano or that hurricane or the tornado, that's the eye of the storm. It's peaceful. The storm goes all the way around it. So if we're in communion in the presence of Christ, the storm is whirling all around us. But in the presence of Christ, with Him completely centered, you know, centering all of our life around Him, that's the place of peace, even in the face of a storm. That's why Christ can rest when all the storm swirls around Him. If we get caught in no man's land, we have one foot on the outside of the camp and one foot thinking about Christ, we will be thrown up into the sky. But as we pursue Christ, as we seek him, we will find him. And in finding him, we, we experience that peace right in the heart of the storm. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what is God's will for the earth? What is our place in this world? What is the end of all of this? Well, we remembered holiness by remembering the Israelites. And our place in the world is actually the same 
as God's people has always been. Think of God's people. They had been blessed way back to Abraham. You have been blessed in order to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's always been God's covenant mission. God's people, as they were delivered out of Egypt, they were no longer slaves. They were ransomed, and they belong now to God. They were part of his family. Their identity was that, was that they were God's people. They were no longer tormented by their slave owners, by the Egyptians. Their life of grief was now buried, just like Pharaoh's armies had been buried in the Red Sea. They were no longer aimless either. The firelight of God's presence in their midst was now visible daily. Well, our purpose matches theirs. God brings his glory to the earth, and when the glory of God comes, the earth is better for it. Think of one aspect of creation that would not be improved if the holy light of God's glory in the face of Christ were to shine upon it. Every inch of this earth will be improved as we reflect the glory of Christ and bring his kingdom. Christ is our great deliverer. He is like Moses who came to set a multitude of captives free. He is the way through which we can part through that Red Sea. And just as God parted the waters of the Red Sea for his people to cross, picture Christ extending his arms and the waters of the Red Sea are the blood of Christ. And as his people are passing through with him, the blood waters wash over our oppression, our grief, our sin. They bury it. We're baptized. We come up on the other side of the water as a new creature. Our identity is in Christ. And we don't have to be afraid of being lost or oppressed. No one is more powerful than our God. Just as God revealed himself to be more mighty than the Egyptian empire, our God in Christ revealed his power. All power and authority belong to Christ now. Christ brings his light to this world and it overcomes the darkness. We have the picture in Revelation 21, again of a mountain. So in Mount Sinai in the wilderness, God revealed his presence on that mountain. In, in Jerusalem, there's this, a mountain right in the middle of the city called Zion, Mount Zion. And the temple sat on top of that mountain. And the city spread around that very similar layout to the tabernacle in the wilderness. And someday this vision in Revelation 21 is a new mountain. And on the top of this mountain, Jesus himself is both the temple, the high priest, and the lamb. That's Christ himself. And there's no need for a sun or a moon because the lamb is the light. And all the nations of the world bring their honor and glory up to the lamb to worship him. So we, we have the opportunity through Christ now. The veil is no longer there. We reflect the glory of Christ to the world. And when we do that, his kingdom comes and his will on earth happens. We see that then, like the arches of heaven. We see this in God's people. This is the kingdom of God and the will of God for the earth, that we be like him and reflect him. I can still be discouraged because I think to the hard situations, the workplace, the stress, the darkness of this world. And I know you experience that at school every week, every day. Be encouraged. And I want to illustrate the potential in, uh, in this story. Because we're here living this out over an entire lifetime. We are understanding this gradually, a little bit more each week and living it out. And this illustration is folks just like us who have grasped this vision of God's kingdom and faithfully lived it out. And so in five minutes, I can summarize what took 30 to 40 years for God to accomplish in a very dark place. And I think my, my stress and my work and my hard relationships are dark. Um, this illustration is a story I heard from a missionary who spent her whole career, uh, 45 plus years, in Colombia. And when she first moved to Colombia, it was in the 19, uh, late 70s, I think, into the 80s. And if you know a little bit about South America, Colombia in the 1980s, Colombia was the major hub for global drug trafficking. And she tells a story of a of a man that she met in prison 
She was working with um, a few people in the prison there. And his name was Alex. And Alex uh, had this vision in his memory of a traumatic experience. When he was a young boy, he saw these guys coming in, busting into his house with machete knives. And he was, he was told by his parents to hide under the bed so he could just see their feet. Um, without being too graphic, he witnessed from under the bed and hiding uh, the, the massacre of his family. Um, so he was, like many kids in that time, left to fend for himself as a street kid in the, the streets of Bogota, of Bogota Colombia. Um, Bogota had the most violent prison in all of Colombia. So Colombia is the, hu- the hub for drug trafficking. The most violent prison in Colombia was the one in Bogota. And through the streets, he ended up in different gangs and ended up in drug trafficking himself. He had become like the same people who killed his family. And through that life of crime, he was then arrested and landed in prison. But through the prison, he met this brave, single missionary lady um, who's still, I believe, still there now in her 70s, still working in Colombia. And this missionary's name is Janine Brabon. And when you, when you see her walking through, she would walk through the most dangerous parts of that neighborhood, and she would be escorted by the drug lords, by some of the most powerful people. You're thinking, how could this lady have earned such respect in this community? Um, and she would walk into the prison, and typically you'd hear the, the calls and the cheers, you know, and they're uh, trying to get her attention. But when she walked through, um, the normal noise of the prison would gradually get quiet as she would walk through. So you're asking, how in the world could a a single missionary lady like this have such an impact and earn such respect and honor, even in one of the most vicious settings you can imagine? Well, Alex was one part of that story and how God brought his kingdom and his will on earth, even in a very dark place like that. And Alex came to know the Lord, the simple gospel of his truth, and learning scripture, accepting this in his life. And then God called Alex, who was sentenced to a life in prison, and he called Alex to be a pastor inside the Bogota prison. And this this man who had been part of violence, who had been in this life of crime, who had seen horrible things with his eyes since a little boy, he was now ministering God's word to the men of this prison. And Janine Brabon was there as an encouragement. She was there helping get them books. Do you want to start a men's Bible study or men's groups that are going to get together and pray, study God's words, read other good books and learn? And there was a revival and a reformation inside the most violent prison in Colombia. It took 30 to 40 years. But now that prison, she's told us, it's now the most peaceful prison in the whole country because there's a church in the center of this prison. And not everyone, it's not like the whole prison now is a follower of Christ, but in the hub of that that prison, even in that community, the holy face of God the Father was there and prodigal sons came running to Him and God began to reorder their lives. No more violence, finding peace, showing forgiveness, turning the other tree, even inside a drug, drug lord prison. And living out those kingdom values. And it's become peaceful. It's become a testament back to their neighborhood where there's no more, um, I mean, no more violence. She can now walk the streets and the people that are in power, they they support her. There's still drug trafficking. But that's the power in a dark world when the light shines. Everything it exposes by the grace of God becomes light. And if that can be true in a prison in Colombia, maybe it can be true in my heart and in my family and in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, and school. Amen? Well, may the lyrics of this hymn capture your imagination one last time today. Stir up our desire for Jesus and encourage us to continue to take up our cross daily and follow Him to allow the weight of Christ's glory to reorder our lives and bring Him glory. So I'm going to read these lyrics and I ask you to, to visualize this. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. 
How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Now remember, Logos, we do this together as a family of God for His glory, for our good, and as a blessing to all nations. Press on with faithfulness. Be encouraged. Our God is good. Amen. Today, as Moses again blessed Aaron and the priests, because through Christ we are now a nation of priests, and we fulfill that same purpose in the world today. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.